Today I'm going to show you how you can monitor the solar production and your grid usage in your home or business in order to have better data about how you're using electricity. This little box has got all the magic in it, so I'm going to show you how to install this in your consumer unit with CT clamps to measure the generation from solar and the grid usage without having to have any other complicated devices. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you do, make sure you like and subscribe. Let's get into it. So the situation here is that this is a fairly new build house. There is a small amount of solar on the roof. The customer wants to know how much solar they're generating and the inverter here is not a smart inverter. It doesn't have an app connection or anything like that. So he has no idea how much solar he's actually producing. And he also doesn't know how much energy he's sending out to the grid or if he's using it all himself. So he doesn't know whether he could potentially have battery storage, for example. So we're seeing this energy monitor today to be able to give him the data to know how he's using his energy and therefore to be able to use it better, which is so key in this time where energy is getting more and more expensive and we want to know how to use it in the most efficient and economical way. This is the Emon Pi energy monitor it's called a Raspberry Pi compatible energy monitoring node. Now I've never fitted one of these before, it's completely new to me. Now there are two versions of this, you can have this one, there's also one that can monitor like way more circuits. So we were looking at the options as to whether to fit one that monitors every single circuit, but actually in this case for the moment just monitoring the solar and the grid is all that we want to do in this current situation. But the question is, well, how do we fit it safely to a consumer unit and set it up and get it all working properly? So I'm gonna talk you through all of that process right now. Let's go. So we're gonna play that usual game of neat or not neat, but for those eagle-eyed viewers, who are our regular viewers, you might recognize this consumer unit. So it's a little bit cheating, but we're gonna do it anyway. Oh, by the way, who fitted this? Oh, Artisan Electrics. Let's see if they know how to fit consumer units. It's always a joy to revisit this property because this consumer unit is absolutely stunning. Uh, there's this guy, you might remember him, his name is it begin with C or something like that. He used to work for us. He's got his own company now called Oi Electrical. Um, you know, it's what it is, unfortunately. Uh, but he did this board for us, and you know, like all of our artisans, he did an amazing job. So uh, shout out to Corey. And today, what we're going to do is just add the CTs inside here. Now, the fact that he spaced these breakers out will hopefully make our life easier when it comes to fitting the CTs. So if you ever are doing a consumer unit change, or if you're a customer and you're thinking that you might want to monitor every single circuit, a good idea would be to ask the electrician to space out the breakers with a blank in between, because then it'll be much easier for them to fit a CT clamp around the wires afterwards. If they were all smushed close together, it'd be really hard to fit a CT clamp around, around everyone, and I'll show you why in a second. I'm gonna just um, get the little thing mounted on the wall, um, start plugging in the CTs and connecting it all up and show you how it works. So this is the Open Energy Monitor website. And if we go down, you can see the various things that they have. We have actually fitted their EV chargers before. Now we're talking about this, the Eman Pi Open Energy Monitor System, which uh, has two CT sensor inputs, as you can see. Uh, one VRMS input, pulse input, temperature sensors, Eman CMS logging, node red and open hab. I have no idea what most of that is. But for those of you nerds out there, I'm sure you will absolutely be salivating over this right now because it's such a great piece of gadgetry that people love to be able to monitor stuff, you know? So it's the ideal kind of DIY nerd uh, tech fest going on right here. So in terms of what's in the box, it comes with this uh, CAT cable, it's a CAT7 patch cable, which is used to connect it to your router. There is another one that goes out of that side, but this is the one that we need to use. There is a five volt DC input as well, so it comes with a plug with a transformer and a little input that we plug in on this side, but there's also a power reference that we need on the other side, so it comes with another power pack which you need to plug in, which is the reference power on that side, and then we've got 
another data cable, we've got an aerial, and we've got our two CTs. And the CTs, or current transformers, as they're called, split core current transformers, they come in these boxes, so you've got these little audio jack connections and they just literally plug in like that. So CT1 is gonna be for our grid CT, which will monitor the whole energy consumption of the house. And CT2 will just go around the cable coming in from the solar inverter to measure the amount of solar energy that's being produced and fed into the house. And then you've got these little mounting brackets. So they go on like that, I believe. One on the top, one on the bottom. And then once those are screwed in, we can literally just screw it to the wall with a screw top and bottom. So that's the bracket fixed on now with the screws on the back. Now what I can do is offer it up to the wall and just find the most suitable place for it and mark my fixing holes. Somewhere around here, the CT cables are gonna come out there, I'll loop them round and up into here. So I wanna lower that enough so that I can put some nice loops on the cable with some cable uh, tie tags and bases to drop in there. Then we need enough room to run the other CT along and down to here and then these data and power cables down to there. So I think about here will be fine and then we just make sure we've got it level. I like to use this little marksman tool just to mark my holes. Okay, we've got a couple of nice green marks on the wall so you can pop a couple of plasterboard fixings in that and get screwed to the wall. So this is what we call a drywall or plasterboard wall. So there's no like studs or wood in it to fix to. So we're gonna use these plasterboard fixings, which are really nice and solid. And um, we're gonna show you a little tip of how to make sure that they go in nice and straight. Now I get to use my safety glasses, which are awesome, safe style head to the link in the description where you can get some really cool stylish safety glasses and get a discount using our special code. So I'm gonna pop this under here and what I would say to you is um, if you do that, it just catches the dust, which is you know really useful to be able to do something like that rather than having to hoover up after yourself. Always just catch the dust first. Now the other thing we wanna be careful of is making sure that there's nothing no cables in the wall that we're gonna screw into. And if you look here, there's actually a double socket below there. So in general, the zones for power and stuff are vertical and horizontal from sockets, switches. So you never really want to, as a rule, drill a hole directly above a socket or switch because there might well be a cable there. Now, I can feel that this is very hollow. So it's very unlikely that there were any and there are any cables there because they're probably going to be further back from the plasterboard. If it was a solid wall and the cables were buried in the wall, I'd be a lot more cautious. But I am going to get my stud finder and just check to make sure that there aren't any studs or anything in there. So this is one of my favourite tools and you might have seen a video where I use this extensively to make sure I find the studs in a ceiling to know where to drill the holes for recessed lights. This is brilliant because it's a stud finder but it's not your usual stud finder. Um, you, you move it a lot across in the wall like that and it's got magnets in it, right? It's got very strong magnets. In fact, I've brought these to show you guys because these are similar, right? So these are super strong magnets and essentially in here is similar to those. And what it does is rather than finding the wooden stud, because how can a magnet find wood? What it does is it finds the screw head that is screwing the plasterboard to the wood. Very clever. So we know now that there's a stud here. And if I get my magnet, I should be able to find the screw. Oh yeah, there we go. There's, there's, our, there's our screw. So if I, if I drop down here, there's another screw here. There we go. And so you can see the line. This is what the line where the screws are. There's another one here. There we go. Can you, see the, can you see the direction? There's definitely a stud in the wall there, which makes sense because that lines up with here. Now, what we want to do is find the same for this. So, I'm going to make sure that there are no studs in this wall, because if there are, there might be cables clipped to them and things that we, we have to be aware of. Okay, so there is a stud here. Okay, there is one. There's one here, so I think we're just missing it. So what I'm going to do is very carefully drill these two holes 
and if, as long as I don't hit any wood, then I'm gonna be able to screw my plasterboard fixings in there and use my little box. Drilling a, pli a pilot hole really helps with these. Okay, so that's good. We've got no wood there. So now with one of these um, plasterboard fixings, we can very easily, with a nice PZ2 screwdriver, just drive that in. And we've got a really nice solid flush fixing there. So now that we've got our plasterboard fixings in, we can just insert our fixing screws like so. The nice thing about this is they've got these slotted holes, so you can just slot the first one in and then slot the top one in and then tighten them up afterwards and you'll get a nice solid fixing on there. Now we need to figure out how to route these cables neatly. The first CT cam, which is this one, is going to go around the solar. So just to let you know what a CT clamp is, it stands for current transformer. It's basically like a magnetic ferrite loop, um, which when a wire passes through and a current passes through, it creates a magnetic field and it reads that magnetic field and induces a very small amount of um, current into this little wire, which the device reads and based on that reading, it knows how much current is passing through the CT. Now these are directional so you need to pass, you need to clamp them with the arrows pointing in the way the current will normally flow. So in the case of the solar we want the current, the current will be flowing down into the consumer unit from the solar so we need to have it uh, in that direction and we need to just double check to see which circuit actually does the solar. So if you've had a great company like Artisan Electrics do your consumer unit you will have labelled circuits although these have faded a little bit. Uh, PV, photovoltaic, that's the one that we want. So it's actually the very end circuit. And the nice thing about that is we've got nice long wires so we can clamp our CT clamp around that fairly easily. I've got plenty of space for the um, CT clamp there. Now, obviously this is a live consumer unit. Um, so we're gonna need to isolate the power in order to pass the cable behind the bus bar uh, and make sure that it's you know, done safely. We don't want to take any risks here. So it's important when you're working anywhere around electrics to perform safe isolation procedure and prove that this, the area that you're working is dead before you do any electrical work. So for the sake of the learners and maybe DIYers who are watching this, to show you how to do a safe isolation procedure to, to work safely on electrics, it's very simple. You have to have a voltage operating device like this. You put it across the live and neutral terminals. So we have clearly got 32, 230 volts there. And if we go between neutral and earth, we have nothing. Between line and earth, we have 230 volts. So we've proved that our tester is working using a known supply. You can use a proving unit as well, but it's quite an expensive piece of kit. So this is probably the easiest way to do it. And then literally what we're gonna do is just turn the main switch off. That will isolate everything. But I'm gonna actually use this opportunity to just turn the RCBOs off one by one and uh, do an RCBO test on them as well. So we'll do that now. So now we've turned off all the individual breakers, we've got to turn off the main switch, which will actually isolate this bus bar under here. This is a copper bar that distributes power across the bottom of all the circuit breakers. And we want to check to make sure that this is now dead coming out of the main switch, which it is. So we go between line and neutral, we go between neutral and earth, and we go between line and earth, and we've confirmed that this is all dead. And then we check again on our known supply, which is the top of the main switch, which is still live. We've got 230 volts, so we know our tester has not malfunctioned during the testing process. So that means it's safely isolated under here. The only live parts are there, which obviously you'd be careful of. There's not a lot we can do to isolate those. So now we're gonna thread the CT cable through to the bottom of the consumer unit. We can thread it through this. Now, there is a hole already cut here where we've installed a, a CT clamp for the electric vehicle charging point that we installed. So we're gonna use that rather than drilling an extra hole. But if you didn't have a hole that was the suitable size, you would need to install, you know, to drill a separate hole. And you can do that using a metal hole saw. Just be very careful because you can get metal swarf and stuff 
goes in your eyes, which is why you need some nice safety glasses. It's through our grommet. That grommet, I don't know why it's called that. If you're a Wallace and Gromit fan, let me know in the comments. But it basically seals around the cable to stop the metal casing of the consumer unit from cutting into the wires if the wires move around. So obviously as electricians, we need to get permission before we turn the power off. Customers here is working from home. So now that I've got the CT clamp through, there's nothing else I need to do in the consumer unit as such. So I'm gonna just turn the power back on um, and then the customer can crack on with his work again. So what I'm trying to do now is find a way to neatly tidy the cables around. So we're gonna put these little sticky tabs on now just to hold it in place. Um, CT2 is for the solar, so that's in place now. And then we'll pop CT1 on, which is for our grid connection. That could go around the main tail in the consumer unit, but I prefer to put as less things as possible in the consumer unit. And we have an exposed piece of tail here that we can easily connect to. So I'm gonna use that to install the grid CT. As you can see, we've already got one for the Hypervolt EV charger. So we can just add another one. And the flow of power on that one is usually um, going into the house. So the arrows pointing that way towards the house consumer unit. So we'll just wrap that round like that. I just use those for demonstration purposes, but you can get these on Amazon if you wanted to use those instead of a stud finder. They can be quite handy. You can just line up loads of them on where the studs are, and then you know, you know, you can see them visually on a line on the ceiling. So if you want to get some of those, I'll leave a link in the description. The CT is nicely clamped on. You've got to make sure it's clicked closed. But a thing to note is you should never put two CTs close, like right next to each other, because the magnetic fields will interfere with each other and you'll get dodgy readings. So you should never have it like that you always want to have a gap as much as possible so that gap is absolutely fine and i just bear that in mind when i'm dressing these cables back in so what i'm going to do is put these little sticky tabs now and just dress the cables really neatly all along another top tip for you guys is when you're using cable ties rather than cutting the top off the bag and they just fall everywhere just do a little slice like that up the middle of the bag they're much less likely to fall out and you can just pluck some out like that shake it around no matter which way it goes they don't fall out and you can just keep them neat and tidy in the bag but you can easily grab them out and take however many you need So we were going to make this video anyway, but we reached out to Open Energy Monitor to see if they wanted to sponsor it. And guess what they said? We would love to sponsor your video. So today's video is sponsored by Open Energy Monitor. Thank you for sponsoring our video. And you guys can get out all the information in the links in the description. So my motto in life is label everything. So we're going to make a little label, a cable flag. For these, we're going to put CT Solar. And we're going to label them up just because we can, and it's nice to label things for future people. I have a slight confession to make. I have a mild obsession with cable ties. Let me know in the comments if you are also slightly obsessed with cable ties. There's something so nice about them. It's so satisfying the way they make this nice clicky noise. So nice. But there's a thing with cable ties, a big mistake that a lot of people make with cable ties is when they cut the ends off, they cut them off with like side cutters like this, for example, um, or with uh, a knife. You, with a knife, it can just be quite dangerous. Like, you know, imagine you're trying to do that and you slip and you cut yourself. With side cutters, I'll show you what happens. You cut them off, but there's always this sharp bit that sticks out and that is dangerous, that can slash electricians hands up when they're working nearby next time so the best thing to do is use these these are your friend right these are called flush cutters these particular ones are by nipex but you can get all different brands of them i like these ones and you they're designed perfectly for cutting things flush so watch look at that that is perfectly smooth absolutely perfect safe lovely neat finish if you're doing cable ties link in the description 
they've got this QR code that takes you to this really handy guide which gives you a system overview and then tells you how to set the whole system up so we've got the Eman Pi system here so we click on that and then it, it tells us about all the features so if you want to you know geek out over this check out that website so in the menu we go to hardware setup install Eman Pi and then it goes through the whole process of how to install it. We just follow these instructions. Clip the CT cable either around the line or neutral. Connect the jack into CT1 or 2. If the power reading is negative, reverse it. Well, we've not powered the thing up yet. Solar, we've got that. Temperature sensors we're not using on this one. Pretty much there. Probably need to install this though. So this is an aerial, which will just screw on here. Okay, so that's that. So we've got our aerial now, and all we've got to do is plug in this reference power supply, which we'll do to a separate socket. The main power supply for the Emon Pi is actually going through a UPS, because our customer has a UPS to back up all of their like network servers and, and internet connection and stuff like that, because they work from home doing very important stuff, and they don't want to be able to, you know, they don't want to have stuff dropping out in the event of a small power cut. But this side is just a reference, basically reference to Earth, I think. So this is the actual main power supply which goes in the back here um, on this little 5 volt DC plug and there we go that powers it up and we can peel this little thingy off so it's booting so this is telling us power 1 which is our CT for the grid 2569 watts so that's how much power the house is using from the grid at the moment power 2 324 watts that's how much that's how much power the house, uh, the solar is producing. The time on here is correct. We're good to go. So we'll, we'll check the customer's app now and see if it's showing up all the figures. So that was a pretty easy install process, to be honest. I think a lot of kind of competent DIYers could probably have a go at that. Um, obviously, the the thing you really need to be careful of is going inside the consumer unit. Wouldn't always recommend that. Um, but in general, pretty simple to install and set up, which I really like. So this is the Emon Pi web interface where you basically go to the IP address of the device, you use login with your username and password, and you can view all the data in here, which is really cool. So this is the graph that we've come up with. The line, the blue line is for the solar, so that's here. And then the yellow line is for the grid, so how much power the whole house is using. And you can see that the solar is generating about 300 watts. It's a little bit of a cloudy day today. The house has been using about two and a half kilowatts, between two and two and a half kilowatts. But if we hit refresh now, you'll see what happens. Just gonna click refresh. Boom, there we go. We've just turned the EV charger on. So we've just started charging the vehicle and it's jumped straight up to like nine kilowatts. You've got basically minute by minute data or even even less than a minute, maybe every 10 seconds or something. And you can see it's just constantly kind of monitoring what's going on, which is really, really cool. So after a few months, the customer will be able to look at this data, see the peaks and troughs, see what the biggest output they've had of solar is, see if they ever go into negative on the grid usage. In other words, do they ever actually produce more solar than the house is using power-wise and therefore do they ever export any solar? Now, I doubt very much, to be honest, because it's such a small solar array, but you know you don't know unless you've got the data and that's a great thing about this you've got the truth here data tells the truth and that is really awesome so they've got this great view here that you can set it up with as well and this is a live view it looks a lot nicer so that's really cool the great thing about this whole system is it's super easy to set up the customer did all the configuration before i got here and it was like three steps just following the instructions on their website and they do have a video that shows you how to do it as well i did make a slight mistake earlier when i said that it came with an ethernet cable it doesn't um, you can connect wi-fi here but i think you do need to plug it in with an ethernet cable to start with just to set the wi-fi connection up and then this one is like a voltage monitoring sensor basically vrms or something it's got an AC AC power adapter and it is essential if you're using it to monitor the solar don't know exactly what it does let me know in the comments if you do um, but that is an essential part of this install apparently but that's it super simple great way to monitor how much electricity you're using 
and generating from your solar. So if you've liked this video, make sure you subscribe and hit the like button. And why not watch the next video, which is all about how we do surveys for solar and battery storage installations to try and save our customers money on their electricity bills. But either way, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.